Hey there, welcome to my January wrap up. I'm not sure if you caught my last wrap up video from December, but I talked about this little reading experiment I've been trying out. So in December, I only read authors who I'd previously read before. And in January, I thought for the start of the new year, I would only read new to me authors. And it's kind of hard to tell which month I ended up liking more because they were both fantastic reading months for me, weirdly enough. They ended up both being really strong months in terms of quality and quantity. So what more could you ask for? If I had to choose between the two, I'd say that December was slightly better as a reading month overall. I think I just read more things that I enjoyed, so I guess there's something that is safe and comfortable about returning to authors who you've already tried. You're kind of familiar with their works. Most of the authors that I read were ones who I already loved, and it was really nice to get that chance to explore their back catalogs in more depth. So I guess overall December was slightly more satisfying. However, I definitely did enjoy the experience of trying trying a bunch of new things in January, there's something exciting about the thrill of finding a new author and falling in love with their style. So I definitely discovered a few authors in this stack here who I'm so excited to keep discovering more of their works as the year goes along, including one author who I think is going to be one of my new all-time favorite authors. So we've got some good stuff to talk about. Today's video will be in two different sections, so we're going to start off talking about the novels that I read, and then in the second half of the video we can get into more of the miscellaneous genres. I've got a lot of comics, some plays, some nonfiction, some poetry, and some short stories to talk about. So let's start off with novels though. And I'm gonna go from favorite to least favorite because I feel like starting off this video on a high point. Let's start off by talking about the author who I'm the most excited about having discovered in January. And that, of course, is Marcel Proust. I picked up Swan's Way, which is the first volume in the In Search of Lost Time series. This was the Lydia Davis translation, and this book just blew me away. It was so gorgeous, so wonderful, and I've made an entire video gushing about my experience reading Proust for the first time, how I had a lot of reservations and misconceptions about reading him that ended up being so incorrect because I absolutely loved this reading experience. So I'll link that video down below if you're interested in learning more. But yeah, this was just my highlight of the reading month. It's funny, I picked this book up thinking that it was going to be my homework kind of chore book that I'd have to force myself through, and I just ended up falling in love with this thing. And I find Proust so interesting because his books are really not plot heavy, right? There's not a lot of story that's happening. And yet I find it really hard to put his books down. I find them quite captivating. Maybe it's the way that he's telling the story, the way that he paints these descriptive pictures of scene and character. I'm just totally mesmerized with what he's doing in this project. So it was such a wonderful way to start off the reading year by discovering a new favorite author. So I'm so glad that I checked out Proust and I'm excited to continue working my way through the rest of this series throughout 2020. My second favorite novel that I read this month is also another 20th century novel written by a French author so it's clear to see that my love affair with French literature is still going on strong in 2020 and that one was Life a User's Manual by Georges Perec. And this was translated by David Bellos. And I have to say, we need to applaud this translator for what he did here. This cannot have been an easy novel to translate since it shifts so much in style and it uses very precise descriptive language. So I think this book must have been a nightmare, but he did a great job. So this entire novel is structured around one moment in time. Particularly, we are looking at 8 p.m. on June the 23rd of 1975, and we are in an apartment building in Paris. And I know what you're thinking, that's kind of a long book to be looking at one moment. But what Perec does is he sets each chapter in the book in a different area of the building. So he basically transports you into a room of the building and will proceed to describe to you everything that is in the room, anything that's happening in the room, what the furniture looks like, is there a person there, what's the story, what's going on. So it is a very strange book. I really haven't read anything like it, but if you are kind of a nosy and curious person who gets invested in little details in fictional people's lives, then I think you might enjoy this one <laughs> like I did. The novel's a little bit disorienting at first while you're getting your bearings. You kind of have to figure out who the people are in this building and the connections that they have with one another. So really the first half of this is you trying to like get sorted through it, but I really enjoyed it more and more as it continued along and you start learning more 
more and getting more context into the lives and like history of the building and it's a really wonderful tapestry that he ends up weaving by the end. And even though this book is kind of infamous for these long dry detailed passages that are just listing every object that is in a room. But I will say that this book never became too dull or tedious for me because Perek has this great eye for detail and this really playful style and I think that there was always an effort to lead you to a narrative. So for example you might be looking at the paintings that are on someone's wall and that will lead you into a narrative about how one of the paintings was inspired or about that artist's life. So he does always try to insert the these large chunks of narratives and they're usually these very strange and humorous stories that will take you you know beyond the place and time that the book is set in so I loved how these stories kind of all added up he uses the image of a puzzle piece at the start of the story to kind of explain how you just pick up a puzzle piece and it has no meaning on its own. You can only understand that puzzle piece in its relation to the other pieces in the puzzle. And that's kind of what this book does, you know, each chapter on its own is kind of meaningless and strange, but when you look at it together, you really do have this cool kaleidoscopic vision of this building and its inhabitants. So I loved the way that he explored people, uh, the connection that we have and our relationship with the past and the people who used to occupy our space, our relationship with our own material possessions. I thought this was a really fascinating book, uh, totally unique, totally strange, totally bizarre, but I'm glad that I checked it out. I did have a lot of fun piecing this one together. Next up I have another two books that I loved and I'm pairing them together because they're just so dark and depressing. Which, you know, January is a tough month to get through, so I thought that they were very appropriate bleak winter reads. The first one of these is The Deeper the Water, The Uglier the Fish by Katja Apekina. And this was actually the first book that I finished of 2020, and it was a five-star read for me, so I thought that that was exciting. My first read of the year being a brilliant one. And oh, this is such a messed up story about family dysfunction. And I love reading dysfunctional family sagas, but I have to say this one took it up to the next level of intensity. So if you like reading about families with deep issues, <laughs> then I think you will really enjoy this one. I'm gonna to try to talk about this book without giving too much away about what it's about, uh, but essentially you're following the story of two sisters. They've been growing up in the South with their mother who has severe mental illness issues and after their mother becomes unable to take care of them, they have to go live with their father in New York. However, they don't really know their dad. They didn't grow up with him being present. So both of these sisters have a really different take on what it's like being there with their dad. And let's just say both of these daughters end up going through really difficult emotional journeys and messed up things are happening to both of them. And this book is a multiple perspective narrative. You'll notice that the chapters are pretty short and you're flipping between people's perspective uh, quite frequently. So I found that that was a great way to just keep me turning the pages in this book. Like I really couldn't put it down. And it was so fascinating getting the sense of both of these daughters because they were so different from one another and experiencing their stories so differently, which I'm always interested in how people can grow up in the same household and have such vastly different experiences. So I feel like this novel explores that brilliantly. So overall this is a very disturbing portrait of a dysfunctional family and I found that I cared so much about both of the daughters of this family that it made this book really stressful because I was feeling protective of them and yet they just go through so much drama and so much difficulty that it can be a lot to process while you're reading this book. But that being said, I thought that it was brilliant. I loved the way that this book was constructed. Like I mentioned, I could not put this one down. I stayed up reading late into the night to be able to finish this one. So it was a really brilliant reading experience, but it's very haunting. So I loved this book, but I will not be able to forget this story for a very long time. Then I also read Small Game Hunting at the Local Coward Gun Club by Megan Gale Coles. If you're drawn to this book because of the pretty pink painting of the deer on the cover, just be sure that you know that you are entering a dark and tormented read because this book was again another really depressing one. I feel like both of these books are exploring 
the kind of horrible things that human beings do to each other. And it's even human beings who love each other and care about each other, but just aren't able to overcome these abusive patterns. And I think both of these books do a really fabulous job of exploring the pain of that experience. So where the deeper the water, the uglier the fish is looking at abuse more through this lens of a family. I would say small game hunting at the local coward gun club is looking at abuse in many different forms in many different kinds of ways. So it can be the way that strangers hurt one another, but it can also be how romantic relationships can end up being very destructive for the people who are involved in them. So this book is set in St. John's, Newfoundland, and it is a perfect winter read since it's taking place in February. You're in like the dead of winter and there's this big blizzard that is threatening to happen and just shut down the entire city. So it's a great bleak winter read. This book is set at a restaurant, and this one also has multiple narrative points of view, and we're exploring the lives of people who are connected to this restaurant in one way or another. So we've got like the owners of the restaurant, some of the people who are working at this restaurant, and some of the customers who are dining at this restaurant. I think the multiple point of view narrative structure worked really well for this book, because each character gets this chance to speak their truth, and you know, they share their story, and you can really feel all the emotions that they're going through through in that moment and it was very interesting to hear how the character would describe another character who you then meet in their narrative point of view and you get that person's take on the story and it kind of works together to form this jumbled portrayal of people who are all you know feeling similar feelings like they're all unhappy and they're deeply troubled but they have these different takes on each other and I think in the end it works well to create these complex character portrayals. There were some moments of comedy uh, particularly the the mayor character when he's in the restaurant was just so like old and bigoted and he was kind of funny and how ridiculous he was but overall this one is a tough one to take emotionally spiritually physically you know it's <laughs> it's a tough read but it was really well done and I'm glad that I checked this one out especially since this made the shortlist for Canada Reads this year which I would not have predicted this book just seems so heavy going and I feel like Canada Reads always seems to vote off books that are too dark and depressing for some reason they want books that explore Canadian social issues but ones that have kind of an uplifting optimistic ending I can't really see this book doing well in the debates because it's not empowering or uplifting. However, I think that there is a lot of value in checking out these more depressing stories that occupy this more negative space because sometimes it can be cathartic to experience that kind of story and to see people feeling their pain and their emotions in such a strong way. So, you know, I'm interested to see how people will talk about this book. I can't help but feel like it's going to be a bit of a mess though. But still, I'm really glad that I read this one. Both of these books are actually debut novels, so I can't go and read more novels by these authors yet, but I will be following their careers with great interest because these books were both emotional wrecking balls. Next up I have another Canadian novel and that's Theory by Dion Brand. She's an author who I've just been wanting to try for a long time and this was such a wonderful starting place for her work I feel like because she does a lot of essays and nonfiction and poetry and novels. It can be kind of hard finding an entry point but this was a really fun light and fluffy read that is also very theoretical and academic which is not a balance that I imagine is easy to strike. This novel is centered around a narrator who is trying to finish up their PhD. It has been many years of this person trying to figure out their thesis and what they're trying to say. Basically, they just have like way too many ideas and it's not being condensed into a serious focused piece of research. And while this narrator is really trying to hunker down and finish their thesis, they are also going back through their memories and thinking about some of the key romantic relationships that they've been in over the past few years. And one of the interesting things about our narrator is that I don't believe their gender was ever clearly revealed to the readers. So I found that that kind of influences the story in a unique kind of way. So even though you do have this character who is like very pretentious and scholarly and tries to use these like academic jargon terms in their narrative voice. It was also very fun and playful seeing these relationships, um, why this person was attracted to each of their lovers and how each of the relationships ended up kind of falling apart. So this was a fun book that looked at love in a very different kind of way from like 
small game hunting, which is this really dark take on these hurtful relationships, where this was more just kind of about how life is all about change and our personality shifts and we take some things from the people in our lives and how our romantic partners, you know, do play a specific role for a specific version of ourselves at that time. And this narrator is kind of wondering how that person ended up affecting them overall in the long run. I can see that the narrative voice might be off-putting to some readers. Like I mentioned, our main character has been steeped in academia for a long time and that really comes out in their voice and the convoluted way that they tell their story. I thought that it was still pretty enjoyable and I like that this book takes quite a few playful jabs at this world of academia and higher education without being too cynical or negative. You know, it's not completely trashing the value of scholars and education. While it is still asking some probing questions about whose voices are valued in academia and whose stories are prioritized, uh, the way that your professors can really control your lives and your research when you're a grad student, the different antagonistic relationships that can form with people people competing in a small field. So I think that this book did do a good job of asking some critical questions, especially when you're contrasting this main character with all of their lovers who are not involved in academia for the most part. So, you know, I'm not someone who went to grad school, so I can't comment on that experience, but I am always fascinated in viewing that experience. So, so glad to have checked out Dion Brand and can't wait to see more from her. Next up on my list is Sanak, and this was a really unique read. So it's written by an Inuk author named Mitiarjuk Napaluk. So this is a pretty cool book because it's the first book that was written in Inuktitut syllabics. So the author wrote this book and then it was translated into French by Bernard Saladin d'Angleur. So he was an anthropologist who was staying with this group of Inuit people and he was interested in the stories that they were telling, so he was kind of trying to get Mitiarjuk to write down her stories. And then it was then more recently translated into English by Peter Frost. So translation of a translation. What makes this novel pretty unique is that Mitiarjuk, at the time when she wrote this, there wasn't really much print culture in Inuit communities, and it was much more of an oral society. So she is someone who wrote a novel without ever having read a novel before, which I think makes this very interesting from a structural perspective because it's a little unfamiliar. She's doing something new with the genre because she doesn't really know the genre. She's not from that kind of like literary culture. So I think that that makes it a really unique reading experience because it's not exactly what you're going to be expecting if you're kind of a Western reader. There's not too much of an overarching plot in this novel and it was rather told through these shorter episodes that would give you more detail about some kind of event that was happening. You read a lot about hunting expeditions and fishing and like skinning of animals, which I will say like that material is maybe not my favorite thing to read about, but at least each episode is pretty short. So you don't have to read about one thing for too long before you move on to something else. And I will say like overall, this was a cool read to learn a little bit more about Inuit culture and seeing it back in the 20th century because things have been changing so rapidly. So it was cool seeing the style of life. So overall, I'm glad that I checked this one out and it should definitely be one that you look into if you're looking to learn more about Inuit culture or what it's like to live in the far north. Unfortunately now we have to discuss some of the novels that I didn't enjoy as much. Uh, the first one of these is Sleepless Nights by Elizabeth Hardwick. This is one I was really looking forward to. It's the slim little novella and I heard that it was like about this woman that's kind of looking back on her life. From the back of the novel it's described as a parade of people, a shifting background of place, a scrapbook of memories, reflections, portraits, letters, wishes, and dreams, an inspired fusion of fact and invention. So, you know, all good things, and that's definitely true. This book does take you through all of these memories and episodes. Unfortunately, what it didn't do for me was add up to something very important or memorable by the end of the book. So while I sort of learned some things that happened in this lady's life, I still didn't get a great sense of who she was as a person and how these memories kind of affected her. So this is one that I read probably about two and a half weeks ago now, and I remember 
so little about it. I really can't tell you a memorable thing that happened in here aside from they kind of hung out around Billie Holiday in one moment. So unfortunately, this was, a, you know, a well-constructed kind of piece of fiction. I just didn't reach me in any kind of way. I am still going to check out Elizabeth Hardwick's essays because I think she might really excel in that form. She does drop a lot of literary references and quotations in her prose, so she's clearly like well-read and very intelligent, but it just didn't work for me in this particular piece of fiction. And then next up I have two novels that are retellings of the Snow Queen fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen. So the first one of these is The Grimoire of Kensington Market by Lauren B. Davis. And the second one is The Snow Queen by Eileen Kernahan. And both of these authors are Canadian authors. So maybe there's something about Canadians that just resonate with this Arctic frosty fairy tale. I also did reread the original fairy tale to prep for this. And unfortunately, where both of these went wrong for me was that I didn't feel like I needed a full novel length retelling of the fairy tale. So the original fairy tale is quite long enough as it is, and I feel like that was the most successful version of telling this story. Maybe that's just my preference as a reader. Like when I think about fairy tale retellings that I actually enjoy, I think about short story collections uh, like The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter, where you can still twist the story around and reinvent it, but you don't have to go through the plot and stretch it out to turn it into this whole story. Because ultimately, these novels don't really end up changing anything major about the plot. And if you already know what the story is, it can be kind of boring to have to go through that whole, like, adventure through the Arctic to get to the Snow Queen's palace. So both of these books I found were kind of interesting at the beginning, but they all lost me by the end as you just had to see the plot through. So I would say um, out of these, I enjoyed the grimoire of Kensington Market slightly more because I found this one had a really great premise, especially at the start of the book. It's set in Kensington Market, which is this great neighborhood in Toronto. However, in Davis's version of Toronto, there is this mysterious street drug that's been going around and taking over people's lives. Basically, once you're addicted to it, you're almost not really living in your own reality anymore but you're like living in the version of reality that you experience when you're on this drug. And our main character in this novel is like the only person who's ever successfully quit this drug, uh, but her brother's still an addict and that's what brings her into this quest. She has to go and try to, you know, save her brother. So I liked how this novel had its own twist on the story, how it had this contemporary but fantastical reimagining of it in this Toronto context. However, this one did start to lose me as the book continued into more of the plot section of it. Once I was experiencing that familiar story again and again, it just kind of lost me. And then uh, The Snow Queen here is a very like straight up retelling. The reason why I picked this one up is because it had references to the Kalevala on the back, the uh, famous Finnish national epic, and also that one of the main characters is a Sami shaman, and I haven't really read many books that explore Sami characters, so I wanted to check that out. However, uh, this one was just like a very straightforward retelling of the story, and I think that this book could be aimed at younger audiences than maybe the type of fiction that I'm used to reading. Like I was definitely thinking that I would have enjoyed this more when I was a kid because it was just kind of a simple like clean prose style but I feel like it didn't really get into the grittier parts of the story maybe like Grimoire of Kensington Market does. So I don't think that the Snow Queen did anything wrong as a retelling. It just didn't match my tastes and I just found it to be a bit dull. So I'd say both of these, I'm kind of glad that I checked them out. It was fun to engage with the Snow Queen in all of these different contexts. But I just say on the whole, they made me realize that for me, fairy tale retellings are going to be more successful when they're brief. So that's it for the novels that I read in January. This video is already pretty long and I still have like 13 more books to talk about. So we're going to move into more of a lightning mode uh, for this last part of the video. I'm just going to try to be a lot more quicker and succinct about my thoughts so we can uh, get through this in a decent amount of time. So to start off, let's talk about plays. One of my reading goals for 2020 has been to read more plays that are not just by Shakespeare, because I love reading my Shakespeare plays, but I'm realizing that I'm missing out on this whole world of drama and I'm hoping to get caught up this year reading some like classic works of theater. So this month I checked out George Bernard Shaw for the first time and holy crap, where has he been all my life? Totally loved him. This is Caesar 
and Cleopatra, and I was interested in picking this one up because I just read Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra in December, and I thought that this was so much more of an interesting take on Cleopatra's character. Because in Antony and Cleopatra, she's much more of this kind of seductive love figure. And, you know, that's more of a tragic romance, not knocking it for what it is. So Shaw is depicting her at a much younger and more vulnerable time of her life, when she's still a child, she's still in this power struggle against her brother, and it's that time when Julius Caesar shows up. And seeing them bond and kind of form this relationship with each other was surprisingly cute. You know, you've got this like gruff world conqueror making friends with this spoiled little brat. So it was, yeah, it was kind of weirdly wholesome. So overall, I thought this play was really entertaining. Yes, it's taking a historical story that a lot of people are probably familiar with, but it is quite playful and refreshing in how it depicts the characters and how they talk to one another. So I really enjoyed his take on these characters, and I'm very excited to continue reading more by this author because he really impressed me with this one. The other play that I read was also another great one, and that was The Spanish Tragedy by Thomas Kidd. I wanted to check this one out because I really like revenge plays, and I'm interested in reading some plays that would have been influential before Hamlet. Because while Hamlet belongs to the tradition of revenge plays, I feel like it also flips the genre on its head a bit and makes some serious departures. So I wanted to see what a revenge play uh, that would have been performed before Hamlet was like to see if it was any kind of influence. And this play was a lot more fun than I was expecting it to be. This guy, Hieronimo, is greatly wronged by some people belonging to the royal families of Spain and Portugal, and he's just gonna go balls to the wall to get some real bloody revenge. So it's interesting because Hieronimo is like a legal official, so he is someone who works with justice and making sure that people get the sentences that they deserve. However, the system doesn't work for him, so he has to go outside of the law and figure out what he's going to do and how he's going to get his revenge. So it was a lot of fun watching how it happened. There were also a few other creative choices in how this play is constructed and performed, so I had a lot of fun experiencing this one. Next up, for poetry, I read the collection called Brute by Emily Skaya. I must confess that this was a total cover buy for me, but look at this. You've got like the moors and some kind of beast eating someone's hand. I could not refuse. Unfortunately, I think the cover might have been my favorite part about this collection. I could tell that these poems were definitely carefully constructed, and Emily writes about tortured, toxic relationships. They feel very personal and vulnerable, and that's a subject I like reading about, but none of them really reached me in that kind of place that I want poetry to go to. So I didn't really love anything in this collection, but I'm still glad I checked it out. Then for short stories, I tried A Guide to Being Born by Ramona Ozabel. This was a real mixed bag for me because the first short story in this collection about the old ladies on the boat was so moving. I was reading this one and crying in the bathtub. I thought it was just beautiful. But then none of the other stories in this collection really hit me on that level and my patience grew thin as the collection continued. So instead of learning to appreciate her style, the more that I read her, I kind of was distancing myself from this collection as I continued on, which I feel like is not the effect that you want to have. So while there were still some cool stories in here with imaginative premises, I can't say the collection as a whole worked for me and I was quite glad to be finished by the end. For nonfiction, I read a memoir and a biography. The memoir was called In My Own Moccasins by Helen Knott. She identifies as a Deneza, Nahia, and mixed Euro descent woman. And this is all about her life story and basically some of the difficult things that she's experienced and how she's worked through that and how she's found her resilience. And this memoir is clearly not just like a self-indulgent exercise where she just wants to talk a lot about herself. Um, she's very clear in the foreword that the reason why she's publishing this is for people in her community or who've experienced a similar thing um, to find a voice uh, to inspire them and to make them feel seen. And you can definitely get the sense while reading this that Helen's being very honest and candid about her experience. So it is a very powerful read and even though it's small and slim it did take me most of the month to read uh, because there is a lot of heaviness in here.
but it was really cool reading about Helen's journey. So I'm excited to have found her voice and I think that she's going to go on to do some more incredible things. And then for biography, I read Prairie Fires, The American Dreams of Laura Ingalls Wilder. So I actually never read the Little House on the Prairie books when I was younger. However, my family did go through this phase where we were ironically watching the TV show when I was a teenager. So I'm sort of familiar with that world uh, from the show. But it was fascinating learning about Laura's life. Um, I particularly loved the first 150 pages of this is so much about the settler experience on the prairies and how extremely difficult that was. Like these first 150 pages just traumatized me because anything that could go wrong basically did. So the family here just go through every type of natural disaster. <laughs> There's honestly so much hardship and struggle that it makes for a pretty gripping read, but it's also very chaotic and stressful. So I definitely did um, appreciate the experience of what it was like, but I also felt like this biography was really interesting in how it presents Laura's story kind of as a way to counter some of the claims that she made about her childhood. Because it's kind of hard to know what happened to her, uh, whether her books are fiction or fact, you know, or a combination of the two. And Laura ended up having this very specific vision of what her family was and what her childhood was and like the value of hard work back in the day. And the author of this biography, I feel like, kind of challenges Laura's own narrative of her own life. So that was pretty cool. Also, there's a lot in here about Laura's daughter, who I knew nothing about, and was also quite an interesting character. So this was just a gripping biography for a variety of reasons. And even though I wasn't really familiar with the work of Laura or her daughter, this biography was just so well constructed that it made me very interested in their story regardless. Finally, let's talk about some of the graphic novels and comics that I read this month. I only read one standalone graphic novel, and that was Agnes Murderess by Sarah Levitt. This is told in a very sparse and simplistic drawing style, but it still had a very gripping and engaging storyline. It's about a girl who has this messed up family situation. She ends up living in Scotland with her wicked grandmother and... One thing leads to the next and basically she needs to leave Scotland and start her life anew in the wilderness of like the new world, North America. And she gets into trouble. As you can see, Agnes Murderess, she does kind of kill people. So apparently Agnes is based off of a real woman. The author learned about this lady's story and was very intrigued by it and wanted to try to like flesh out this character to see why she was doing the things that she was doing. And I think she did a really good job of inventing the story and sharing it with the reader in this graphic format. And this was a book that I only read in a few sittings, even though it's kind of a long one. Um, it was just a compelling story and I wanted to know what was going to happen. So this is a cool one if you're looking for some dark female murderer content. And then all of the comics that I read are all issue ones of different comic series. Basically, I'm trying to fill the void in my existence that I have after finishing the Sandman series by Neil Gaiman back in December. That was so wonderful working my way through that whole story arc that I'm looking to repeat the experience and I thought I'd just try a bunch of different series and see which ones I liked best. So let's talk about these in the order of least likely to continue the series to most likely to continue the series. And since I haven't uh, continued on with any of them yet, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you have read some of these as well. So the one that I'm least likely to continue onwards with is The Backstagers. <laughs> I picked this one up because I thought it would be a cute little read. It's about this group of teenagers who are involved in theater, but on more the technical side. So they're the ones who are working backstage and making the magic of the theater possible for the actors. And they get into some shenanigans and the backstage world is kind of more magical than anyone realizes. The artwork was cute and the characters were sweet, but overall I think that this was a bit more YA than I typically like my comics to be. It was just a bit too cutesy and like wholesome. You know, it's really about like the friendship and the bond between these characters, which is nice, but it was just a little bit saccharine for me. So 
you know, I appreciate the arts in high school. They were important to me too. So I'm glad that this exists, but I don't think that I need more of this in my life right now. Next up, I checked out Rat Queens. This is a fantasy series that follows a group of female mercenaries. They seem to be pretty problematic in their world. They seem to cause more problems than solving problems. And in this first volume, you see that they've been kind of set up to get attacked and they're trying to figure out what's going on and who's turned against them. So really this felt like a classic volume one of just kind of like introducing us to the world and the characters and their relationships with each other. And as you can see from the cover here, it's just a lot of fighting these fantastical beasts. I kind of enjoyed it in the moment, but I don't know that I'd continue on with this series. I liked that this series doesn't take itself too seriously and it tries to like undercut some of the intense moments by making jokes. Unfortunately, I feel like the humor is kind of dated. So I could see how this would be funny like when this first came out, but I think jokes have kind of changed uh, since this book has appeared. So it didn't always work for me. So glad I checked it out. Not sure I'll continue though. Next up we have Revenger by Charles Forsman. This is an awesome kick-ass revenge tale and I really liked it but it's a bit lower down on my list because even though it says that this is volume one I don't think that any other volumes have been published or necessarily are planning to be published so that would be a bummer if this doesn't continue. What I liked about this is that it's not trying to do anything very new or original but what it does do it just does really well. It follows the adventures of this lady here, known as the Revenger. People contact her when they're in need of some help, and she just goes and does what she has to do to get the job done. So this is a tale that you can see the artwork. It's nothing fancy, really, but there's just some good action, and she just is tough as nails, and she just gets the job done. So I don't know why. I just found this to be like a really satisfying and fun comic. Next up is Punk's Not Dead. I had to pick this one up when I saw Sid Vicious on the cover. And actually, Sid Vicious's ghost is one of the main characters in this series. Um, it's about a teenage boy who sort of has these weird psychic powers that he doesn't really know about yet. Uh, but for some reason, Sid Vicious's ghost has started following him around and they're starting to uncover the powers that he has. And at the same time, there's another plot about this woman who works for the government to investigate these kind of psychic mysteries. So you can tell that later in the series the paths are going to cross of these two characters. But yeah, this one was just a lot of fun. Um, the art style is really colorful, really poppin', a lot of punk influence in here. I will say that the story could be a bit disjointed sometimes, like things would happen and the pacing felt weird, but it was really inventive and I had a lot of fun meeting these characters in this world. So I think I will be continuing on with Punk's Not Dead. Next up we have another series that I really enjoyed and that was Heathen. This is set in this Norse mythology kind of world, but it's told from a more female perspective. Because if you read the Norse myths, women usually do get the short end of the stick in those stories. Um, it is really like this like macho culture that comes across. So it is cool to explore female perspectives from this kind of world. So in particular, we've got one girl who wants to be a warrior, but she's been kicked out of her community after she was caught kissing another girl and queerness was really frowned upon in her community. Uh, so she wants to go be a hero and rescue Brunhilde, who is Odin's daughter that's been banished in this magic fire on top of a mountain. So Volume 1 did a good job of taking us through this quest and introducing us to these characters and making me intrigued to see where this story is going to go next. And the series that I'm the most intrigued about continuing ahead with uh, would be Fables. I've heard mixed things about this series. Uh, from what I understand, it's about characters from fairy tales and folklore who have been exiled from their community and they have to live in New York, but they kind of have to operate in this secret society because they don't want normal people knowing about them. So I think that's a really intriguing premise. I like the idea of returning to these characters who we knew in our childhood, but seeing them in this different context. I will say that I was quite intrigued after Volume 1, and I've heard that Volume 1 is one of the weaker points of this story. 
since it's kind of more set up as this mystery where one of the characters, it appears like they're dead and we're trying to figure out what happened. I think volume one did a great job of introducing the characters while still hinting that there are so many larger issues and factors at play. There's definitely a large scope of possibility for what's going to happen in this series. So it did catch my interest and I am curious to continue along and see where the series goes. So that's it for the books that I read in January. Thanks so much for checking out this video. Please let me know if you have any thoughts about these books in the comments down below and I will see you again soon. Bye!